I'm ready. All it's right. recording. Okay. All right. Here we are. Our new series, Friends. I'm so glad that we can actually, we have a huge crowd tonight. So I was like, man, this weather is going to be crappy. And then we're not going to have anybody come here tonight. But look, we have lots of friends. And we're doing Friends. All right. Who can answer this? On three. One, two, three. God. Yeah. All right. About six weeks ago, or maybe maybe about eight weeks, I asked you guys this question, and it was like crickets in the room. So obviously something sticking. Maybe it's a little memorization, but hopefully that there's more than memorization, but there's ap actually application going on as well. When we learn this. There's a purpose for it that we're here to be stretched in our faith so that when we go out into the world that we can reach out to those people, redeem those that don't know Christ, and that our lives are glorifying to God for everything that we do. Now we're in a new series, okay, and it's called Friends. All right, how many of you guys have ever seen the TV show Friends? Recognize the theme song? All right, how many of you were born uh, after 1994? Okay, most of us, all right. Uh, Friends was on TV for about 10 years, okay? And some of you may have seen it. I know I'm getting old when Friends is on Nick at Night, okay? Do you guys know what Nick at Night is? Okay, I remember when I was your guys' age, I would watch like Dick Van Dyke and like Get Smart and things like that on, on Nick at Night. Now, Friends is on Nick at Night. So I know I'm getting old when Friends is on Nick at Night. But Friends, obviously, their kind of themed uh, logo or whatever else was pictures of people from the cast uh, and then their title Friends on it. So we stole the Friends idea and instead of using uh, pictures of them, people that we don't even know, we took pictures of you guys, our friends, and we came up with this wonderful design. So that's, you guys are celebrities for four weeks. So thank you for allowing us to put your beautiful faces on our pictures. Now. However, this may be some challenging topics for some of us to get into. It's going to be a four-week series, and uh, based on a survey that we had you guys do probably about a year ago, I asked you guys to write down topics of things that you guys would like to cover, things that might be interesting to study, and some of the things like two-faced and gossiping and things like that. And so uh, we've consolidated some of those things into a couple of our messages, and so tonight's message um, is about support and and distractive friends okay friends that are supportive and friends that are distracting to us in our relationship with god now throughout this series though we're going to have this theme okay how many of you guys have ever had your parents or your guardians say to you oh if you hang out with that person you're going to get in so much trouble because they're bad news you better not hang out with those people anybody ever had their parents tell you that okay all right well, whether your parents or your family members know what they're saying is biblical or not, okay? The Apostle Paul wrote this to the church in Corinth. It's in your guys' notes. Don't be fooled by those who say such things, for bad company corrupts good character. Okay? This is going to be our theme throughout this series because depending on who we choose as friends and our relationships, uh, we may have good character, but it may be corrupted by some of those people that we choose to make our friends or our relationships with um, when we leave the church here. And so uh, our theme is going to be that throughout this series. That's going to be our, our foundation text that we study. And hopefully we'll apply this to our lives. Because when I was your guys' age, I had some friends and um, they definitely probably corrupted my character and I probably corrupted theirs a little bit myself. But I had some friends, you guys ever been through the Dairy Queen drive through Anybody ever been through there? Some of them have a big ice cream cone at the drive through speaker, okay? Well, my friends thought it would be a brilliant idea to steal the ice cream cone from the drive through sign thing. So uh, this guy's running around with the top of an ice cream running around on his head, all right? Uh, I chose not to go with them that night. <laughs> They ended up getting community service hours because they got busted for stealing it from Dairy Queen, okay? So, um, bad company corrupts good character. All right, so here's our, our series breakdown. 
support versus distract. Friends that support and friends that distract us from our relationship with God. Week two, we're going to talk about friends that build us up, encourage us, and then uh, we're going to talk about friends that put us down. People that bring our 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 like self-esteem and everything to the ground. Week three, we're going to talk about people that are real and people that are two-faced. And week four, we're going to talk about people that lead us to Jesus and people that lead us away from Jesus, okay, to conclude our series. So that's our series breakdown. I'll leave it up there for a few minutes for you guys to write it down. Now, um, before we get into all of this, I'm going to tell you, I'm trying to cover four chapters of Scripture in 20 minutes, okay? So this is a lot of Scripture that we're going to, uh, I'm going to try to breeze through. I'm going to consolidate. I'm going to paraphrase. Um, if you guys want to know everything that we're going to cover tonight, um, it's in Nehemiah 1, 2, 3, and 4, okay? Nehemiah 1 through 4 are the chapters we're going to cover. Now, to give you guys a little bit of an understanding about Nehemiah before we jump into the scriptures, Nehemiah was a cupbearer for a king, okay? A king who was lived in another country, okay? Nehemiah was this Jewish guy, and um, he was now this cupbearer for this king, and the cupbearer's responsibility was to taste the drink, before the king took a drink, because if it was poison, bam, cupbearer was dead, not the king, okay? So he had a pretty risky job himself. And um, so that's kind of a little bit of background about who Nehemiah is. And I'm gonna fast forward here and we're gonna get started. So just a reminder, Nehemiah 1, 2, 3, and 4. All right, if you guys wanna follow along in your notes, I've got part of our text um, up here on the screen if you guys wanna follow that too. Hananiah, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other man. And I questioned him about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile, and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, Those who survived the exile are back in the province and are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates have been burned with fire. Nehemiah 1 verses 2 through 3, okay? So this is the start of the story, okay? Nehemiah, we find out he's a cupbearer of this other king. Next thing you know, his family members come up on the scene and they're telling him about the things that are going on in Jerusalem and that the walls have been burned and destroyed and everything lies in catastrophe. Okay, if I can think about what it might have looked like if, if we would have went to Joplin, Missouri after they had that huge tornado and you couldn't recognize anything, that's what I would imagine that these walls of Jerusalem looked like when Hananiah was trying to describe it to Nehemiah. So Nehemiah immediately breaks down and he starts crying. In the rest of chapter 1, he's praying to God and he's saying, God, forgive my people for their sins. Help us restore this place. Help us restore these walls. Use me to help rebuild these walls for these people. And so Nehemiah is praying this and he's trying to ask the Lord for favor. And in chapter 2, Nehemiah approaches his king and asks his king if he can have time off so that he can go and rebuild these walls. And so Nehemiah has this vision of rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem and God's burdened his heart to do it. And so today we're going to find out about friends that support him and people that are there to distract him on his journey. Okay, so that gives us a little background. So, supportive friends. What do you guys think support means? Go ahead and shout it out if you guys think you know a definition for support. Friends that help. Friends that help, okay. What else? <clears throat> I think Ronnie pretty much nipped it in the butt right there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so here's what Webster told me. Webster told me that oh. if friends to, to help maintain, to preserve, and to assist. So in your little notes on the back side, if you guys want to put these in your blanks, you guys can. Uh, I've left some space there so you guys could write these things down. The reason I put assist colored is because I feel like that emphasizes the most of what these supportive friends did. Okay, Nehemiah had this calling and this vision that God had burdened his heart for, and his friends are now showing up on the scene and they're saying, look, Nehemiah, we're going to hear and we're going to help you and we're going to do whatever we can to help you succeed at what you're doing or what God's called you to do. All right? 
So let's hear about these random people, okay? Elisha, the high priest of his fellow priests, went to work and rebuilt the sheep gate. They dedicated it and set its doors in place, building as far as the Tower of a Hundred, which they dedicated, and as far as the Tower of Hanel. The men of Jericho built adjoining sections, and Zachar, son of Imri, built next to them. The fish gate was rebuilt by the sons of Hashanah, and they, they laid its beams and put its doors, bolts, and bars in place. Okay, so I've, I've underlined some of the text in here for you guys to really pull out. Okay, there's high priests working to support him. They went to work, they rebuilt, okay? Then there's people from Jericho that are building other sections. There's people from other areas that are putting up the poles, that are putting up the bars, that are tightening things down. Okay, so there's a whole group, okay? If you guys read Nehemiah 3, you probably fall asleep reading it, okay? I'm just going to summarize because all of Nehemiah 3 is about all of the people who went to help Nehemiah build these walls back up. They're there to support, they're there to help whatever ways they can. And so each little group, each little um, community of people went and they took a certain section and they built it up. And then another group went and they built it up. And so this whole group of people is supporting him. And so I put this little section in here so that you guys see that there's people that start supporting Nehemiah on his pursuit of doing it, okay? Most of us have supportive friends in our life, okay? Some of us, we can think of them like that, okay? Um, some of them, you know, if we spent some more time thinking about it, as I was thinking about some of the most supportive people in my life, um, I'll start with the right, my friend who is in the fine uh, military uniform. He's a army chaplain. Um, he's a seminary student. He's got his master's in divinity, a really smart dude. Um, I went to Uganda with him. Uh, we went to New Orleans after Katrina hit. Um, we helped together. We formed a nonprofit mission organization. This guy has always been supportive of me and pursuing a call to ministry and really been there to help me through tough times. One of the times that I remember was as I was getting ready to graduate, I applied for a job that I felt like God was really leading me to, to go and work for, and I didn't get it. And it really, I mean, it really hurt me, it shook me up a lot really shook my faith because I doubted that God, you know, was really there to help walk me through and that I had really heard from him to go and pursue this. But little did I know, my friend, he uh, had a little higher credentials than me. He had his master's in divinity, and so he was probably a better looking candidate. Well, my friend applied for the same job, not so that he could get the job, but so that if he got the interview, he would go down there and he would tell them that they made a mistake in not hiring me. That's how much he supported me. He believed in me and what God was doing in me so much that he was willing to sacrifice a job interview so that he could tell people who God was, what God was doing through me in ministry. And so uh, that's TC. And then on the other side, most of you know at least the beautiful woman in the picture, my wife. Um, whether you guys see things that she does or doesn't do, or whether she's here Wednesday nights or not, my wife is the most supportive person in my life when it comes to ministry. There's times that I get, you know, I, I leave here and I'm like, man, God, that was such a crappy teaching. I did such a horrible job of presenting God's word tonight. And she's like, no, God used you and, and know that God spoke to those kids however he needed to speak to them, whether you thought that they did a good job, you did a good job or not. Or when, I, when, when there's like only a couple of us here, it's like two or three people and I'm Brent's teaching and I'm like, man, where is everybody? Like, I was so excited to deliver this message and there's a couple of them that are gonna get it. And she's like, Graham, if those two people take that message and carry it on and share it to those other people, then more and more are gonna learn through those few that came here. So my wife has always been supportive and continues to be supportive of ministry and what God's doing. And then the guy in the middle is my mentor from college and a guy I still keep in close com communication with. Um, his name's Quinn and he's been an awesome dude who's encouraged me along my ministry route and what God's done. So if you guys think of supportive friends, while you're thinking of supportive friends, if you want to fill in your blank, um, supportive friends work with you to help you achieve what God has planned. 
So your friends that believe in you, that support you, and what God's doing in your life are going to do whatever they can to help you reach that level that God's called you to do. So if you guys want to write people that you think of that are supportive friends, you guys can fill that in right right below that little uh, quotation and write whoever you think um, are supportive people in your life. Now, however, there's always those people that somehow distract us and keep us away from the things that God may be desiring to do through us and want, to, want us to be a part of. So how many of you guys could define a distraction or know what distract means? Anybody? Ronnie, you got the last one. What's distract mean? Like, this is my work in the class, and it's really... Okay, that's a good one. Anybody else? Miss Guy. Miss Guy, okay. Anybody else? Those are good. Okay, here's what Webster told me. To separate, to trouble greatly, or to disturb, okay? And I feel like to disturb, um, as we get into... Uh, the distracting part of our teaching. Uh, we're going to learn from these guys that are trying to distract Nehemiah and his vision um, that they're really disruptive people that are trying to detour him from what God's called him to do. So that's what distract is. Let's look at our notes here and see about these distracting people that are around Nehemiah. When Sambalah heard that they were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly in seized. He ridiculed the Jews, and in the presence of his associates in the army of Samaria, he said, What are those feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to, back to life from those heaps of rubble burned as they are? Tobiah, an Ammonite, who was at his side, said, What? They are building what they are building is even a fox climbing up on it would break it down, break down their wall of stones. Nehemiah four, one through three. So there's two guys, Tobiah and Sambalit. And they're Nehemiah's not buddies with them, okay? And the reason that I chose these this story to talk about this is because these two guys are trying to destroy the vision and what God's trying to do through Nehemiah to accomplish the task that God's burdened his heart with. And so Nehemiah continues, he rallies the troops, all these people are building these walls in chapter 3, things are going great, and then you get to chapter 4, and then these two distracting people come on the scene, and they're doing everything that they can to discourage and to help other people see that Nehemiah is an idiot, that they shouldn't be following him, that they'll never accomplish their task that they have, and God's got other plans in store. If you guys read on further, you'll read that in chapter 4, the people start kind of, they build the wall up halfway, and then they're kind of discouraged. They're like, well, what about these other people, these other armies that may come get us? And, and Nehemiah kind of gathers them up and starts kind of coaching them on again. But these two people do whatever they can to distract what God's doing through Nehemiah and these people and building this wall. Can I answer it in a second? Oh, yeah. Um, and so these, these two guys are trying to keep him from building this wall. Now, distracted friends don't always, we may not call them our friends or distracted people in our lives. They may be positive distractions or negative distractions. Okay, somebody who stays up all night texting you, you're like, oh my gosh, I love you. Oh my gosh, now I love you. Now I love you more. No, my cat's cuter. No, I farted. Oh, <laughs> okay, why well, I love No, all right, so you text and 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 normally you spend your time praying at night or normally you spend your time reading your Bible or, or journaling or something and spending time with God, but no, you're too busy Snapchatting on, on your text message. Ah, oh, check this out. Oh, and, and so the next thing you know, you're tired and you don't have any time for God. They've distracted you. Now, I'm not saying those people are horrible people, okay? But they have been a distraction for you in your relationship with God. Now, maybe somebody is ragging on you. Maybe, maybe you, you know, you're supposedly friends with them, but they're ragging on you because you don't want to go play video games because you want to go to church tonight, okay? Obviously, you guys chose church over the video games. Maybe none of you play video games. But 
that'd be like something similar that you guys, you know, people make fun of you because you choose to come to church on Wednesday night instead of go to the movie, instead of watching a TV show, instead of whatever it may be, you guys choose to come here to grow in your relationship with God, and here's these people trying to distract you and rag on you and tell you you're an idiot, you're a Bible beater, you're Jesus freak, and you're stupid, and what do you believe in this religious crap for? That's what they're saying to you. They're distracting you from your relationship with God. And, and that's hard. Trust me, I've been there. But, however, there's negative things, too. There's people that are there to distract you from your relationship with God because they're inviting you to parties. They're wanting you to go and smoke after school. They're wanting you to go and get drunk on the weekend. Those people, you're smiling, but they're there. They're distracting you guys and your relationship with Christ because they're asking you to go this direction from what God's calling you to go maybe this way. God's burdened your hearts for something. God's got a plan and a purpose for you over here, but somehow you're being distracted and kind of led in this direction. And then the last thing, you know, maybe maybe it's not anything like partying or things like that. Maybe you're just sending pictures back and forth with a guy or a girl that maybe aren't appropriate. And you know if your mama saw those messages or those videos that she wouldn't be happy. So imagine how Jesus feels about those. Imagine how that hurts his heart because you're being distracted because you want to impress these people that are distracting you from your relationship with Christ. So whatever it may be, positives or negative distractions, there's people in this world that maybe we need to sever those ties. Maybe we need to say, you know what? I understand, you know, I care about you, but I can't continue living my life this way because you're causing me to go a direction that I know God doesn't want me to walk down. And that's difficult. But we have a choice. We have a choice to choose supportive friends, people that are going to encourage us and build us up and help us achieve what God's put in our hearts, or we're going to choose people who are going to distract us and lead us astray and cause us, I mean, it says it, that company corrupts good character. That's what's going to happen if we hang out with those distracted friends. Distracted friends work against you to help you fail at what God has planned. They may not intentionally say, hey, Julie, I want you to suck at this, so I'm going to do this, this, and this to help you suck. Okay, they may not say, they may not acknowledge that they want you to fail. They may not, that may not even be a thought process to them. But it's there. They're distracting you from your relationship with God, which is causing you to struggle and to have conflict inside. Well, should I be doing that? Should I not be doing that? And that's what God's stirring in each one of us to choose friends in our relationships. So let's back off our friends for a second. Where do we fall? Where do we fall in this category? Are we supportive? Are we texting people that we're going to pray for them when we know they're having a hard time? Are we supportive? Are we going to send them messages and say, look, here's a scripture that I read this morning. I just felt like God wanted me to share it with you. Or are we going to distract people? Are we distracting people currently? How are we helping or not helping? When I was in college, this is the biggest transformation moment in my life was when I was sitting in the dorm rooms. And I read the scripture, Matthew 18, verse 6, and it said that anyone who leads one of my children astray will be better off tying a millstone around their neck and being hung and dropped into the sea. That's pretty heavy. But God was saying that it's better to go and commit suicide and jump into the sea with a rock around your neck than it is to lead my children astray, to distract my children from following and pursuing me. And so, evaluate. Am I a supportive friend? Am I a distracted friend? And if you're like, well, I'm not really doing either. Well, the middle's just as bad. Because we don't have the courage to choose the supportive, and maybe we're kind of afraid of the distractive. And so we're stuck in the middle. We're not hot or cold, we're lukewarm. And God's saying, look, I want you to support people. I want you to encourage your friends. I want you to tell them that you believe in them and that what God's told you to do, that you're going to help them achieve it. God doesn't want friends that are going to cause problems. So think about those things tonight as we go into small groups. Think about 
distracting or supportive friends? Are you one or do you have them? And if you have distracted friends that you know are bad news, then maybe tonight is Jesus saying, tapping you on the shoulder saying, dude, get rid of them. I've got something better planned for you. And I know that I'm going to use you to do great things. So let's pray and we're going to go into a small group. Lord, thank you for tonight and thank you that we can come and worship you in this place. God, we know that uh, you've done great things in each one of our hearts, God. And Lord, that you surround us with people that are there to help build us up and encourage us and to strengthen us and to support us. But Lord, there's also people in our lives that are there to distract us and lead us astray. And God, we just pray that you would help us to leave tonight evaluating what kind of friend are we and also evaluating what kind of friends do we need to remove out of our lives so that we can continue to grow in our relationship with you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. I think, I think Ronnie had a question. Okay.